Yeah, it, it introduce oh, yourself. All right, I'll just dive right in. Wait, uh, please, please, please introduce yourself. That's the first slide. Oh, or okay. The second slide. <laughs> the first slide is uh, rendering HTML with Drupal past, present, and future. Uh, I'm Steve Persh. I'm no. I believe me. I am Steve Persh, and I have a slide that says so. <laughs> uh, if I can bring it up. We'll believe it when you there we go. All right, I hope you see first. I'm Steve Perch, believe it. Uh, I'm a senior engineering team lead at Palantir.net. Palantir is a Drupal development firm, web development firm uh, based in Chicago. Been around for about 20 years. Uh, one of the nice parts about Palantir is that I get to live up here in Milwaukee. The company is based in Chicago, but we're all over the country. So uh, let's dive right in. Uh, caveat, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about Drupal's past, present, and future, rendering HTML, Drupal past, present, and future. A lot of the ideas I'll be talking about as the past are things that we still do now. What can you continue to do in the future? Some of the future things are available now, they were available years ago. Uh, I'll mainly be talking about the circumstances of the past, the circumstances of now that shift the technologies that we use. So what are we doing when it comes to HTML and Drupal? Uh, by one definition, web programming is the science of coming up with increasingly complicated ways of concatenating strings. And by this measure, Drupalers are really, really good scientists. We've come up with some incredibly complex ways of concatenating our strings taking those little bits of HTML and stringing them together. And let's talk about our main concatenator, uh, the theme function in Drupal. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, the theme function, its basic idea is to take a type of themable thing. Here's an example of an item list. So theme item list and its precursors have been around in Drupal since 2002. Uh, the basic idea of an item list is you give your list a title, like a grocery list. You build up the list of items, fruit, bread, cheese, and meat. You tell Drupal, I would like an item list, please. Here are my variables. And Drupal gives you some pretty basic HTML, a wrapping diff saying here's your item list, an H3 for your heading, and an unordered list for your list. Uh, not too complicated. The basic idea is that you're telling the theme system what you want to print. An item list, you pass in your content variables, the theme system then goes and finds the function theme item list, gives it those variables, and if you want to override that function, maybe if you want to change that h3 to an h4 or an h2 or something, you can make a custom theme. You're probably going to do that anyway for any site you're making. If you're making a site for the Acme Corporation, Acme item list becomes the way you override, or my site theme item list becomes the way you override that. So that's Drupal's main concatenator. But it can get complicated. So this might look simple. We're loading a node object. You can load node one, two, three. You've got a node variable, and then you just tell the theme system, print me a node, please. Here is my raw node object. And what you get back is some pretty complex HTML. This is from Drupal 7. What's happening here is Drupal is telling you as much as it possibly can about the node through wrapping divs and through CSS classes. <coughs> We've got CSS classes that tell us this is a node. This node is an article. It's promoted. This is a teaser of the node. This div tells us I'm a div that's coming from the field module. Uh, the name of the field is field image because there's a class that says field name, field image. Really verbose class names that tell you as much as they possibly can about the internal data layers of this node object and everything inside of it. Again, the basic idea, you're just saying, theme system, I'd like you to print me a node. Print me this node. And because it's just a raw node object and isn't anywhere near ready to be printed to HTML, there's a complex pre-processing layer that's going to take that raw node object and grab the fields, grab the actual username because all the node object knows is the user ID number. That's not a printable username. 
So a whole lot happens in pre-processing. Now in Drupal 7, the process layer, uh, hooks, lots of stuff. But eventually, you get to a template file, node.tpl, and those variables that have been added through this complex pre-processing system can actually get printed into a template file. If you want, you can override that template file again in your custom theme. You can name node.tpl again. If that node type was a blog post, you can make node hyphen hyphen blog post, and you've overridden that template file. So it's a simple enough idea, but how did we think about it? Uh, this, in this presentation, I'll, I'll be talking about the way we at Palantir thought about theming in Drupal and how that's changed. In the past, the way we thought about theming was this concept called sustainable theming. And I'll let Colleen Carroll, um, now our director of operations, but back in 2008, she was one of our front-end developers, and she described the goal of sustainable theming as uh, an extensible design, a design toolkit that continues to evolve without the help of an HTML or CSS developer. That's the ultimate goal, a design or a theme that stays intact as you add new content and new layouts to your site. The basic idea is we want a design that's not gonna break as the details of your site changes, as more content gets added, as new content types get added, the theme should continue to work. Let's talk about the given circumstances of 2008, 2009 that affected the way we went about achieving that goal, which is still a good goal. We still want our designs to work, to not break as our, as our sites change. Back then in the Drupal 5 era, it was a given that our designs were JPEGs or Photoshop files or PDFs. They, uh, they weren't CSS and HTML, but Drupal was giving us a ton of HTML for free. So at the beginning of a project, you might get designs that are gonna be probably in Photoshop, and as soon as you start doing anything in Drupal, you're gonna get a ton of HTML just by doing anything at all. It's also a given that uh, you're going to get all of the host really verbose classes, more classes than you probably even want. Uh, the pre-processing layer in the Drupal 5 era was nowhere near as robust as it is now. So changing those classes was really painful, really time consuming, very hard to do. So we didn't bother. Uh, in the Drupal 5 era, what we now call view modes were build modes back then, and you only had two. You had full and teaser. So the way you went about changing how those looked was either through the views UI or using all of those CSS classes in different combinations. So uh, Colleen in 2009 in a blog post said, Drupal is not a build a template first system. It's an install a module and theme it system. There, there are people now, people back then, who want to do the templates first, who want to figure out the markup that they want because they're good at HTML and CSS. Drupal, back then especially, did not accommodate that philosophy well at all. It was build your stuff first and then make it look right. Uh, George Demet, our uh, founder and CEO, emphasized doing as much as possible in CSS. Don't touch template.php. Don't touch the TPL files unless you absolutely have to. If you only do CSS, the thinking was back then, your theme will be more portable, it'll be more upgradable, more maintainable. Again, these are all still really good goals. We want our themes to be portable, we want them to be maintainable, we want to be upgradable. Um, but the way we went about it was don't fiddle with the HTML. That was the thinking at Palantir in 2009. Everything can be done with CSS and should be done with CSS. That was our mentality in 2009. So what did that CSS look like? Uh, well, it had to match those classes. So field, field, headline. We know this is coming from the field module and we have a field named field headline. Not a pretty CSS class, but really, really descriptive. It tells us a whole lot about the backend system that produced the CSS class. Uh, same field, but now it's views field, field headline value. The CSS class tells us views module is printing something, views module is calling the field module, bringing up the field, field headline, specifically the database column value. Uh, again, a really, really verbose class, but very descriptive. And if you know the internals of Drupal, 
this class tells you a whole lot. Uh, but there's a downside. I was looking through one of our projects from this era and I found this rule. And we have six different selectors all applying a border bottom. All of these end with views row, so obviously we want our rows to have a bottom border. Okay, but these are all the names of specific views. This tells me that if you want to add another listing and you want it to look like this, you're going to have to come back and edit this CSS file. Uh, that's, not, that's not very encouraging. But in a world where CSS is your only API to the browser, where editing the HTML is too painful to even try, the more CSS selectors you have, the better. The more divs, the better, because you don't know which ones you're going to need, so throw in as many as possible. The longer the class names, the better. Views, field, field, headline, value is a really great CSS class in this world because it tells you exactly what it is. And long multi-element selectors get really tempting because uh, you can't change the classes, you can't change the markup. If you want something to look different on a different page, you're going to have to string together a bunch of selectors. So Drupal, by default, back then and now, exposes each internal data model layer as a wrapping HTML element. So what are we doing in this era? We're making Drupal elements look like the design. There's no way they can be the design because the design is Photoshop, is a JPEG. The best you can do is try to make it look like the design. You can't match fonts exactly back in 2008. They're gonna look different on every machine. <laughs> that CSS example had a really long string of font options because back then, the best you could hope for was looking like the design. I think Stephen Colbert is a good way of understanding this mentality. He's got a Latin phrase above <laughs> his fireplace, "Wadere quam esse, which means to seem to be rather than to be as an inversion of the North Carolina state motto, to be rather than to seem to be. That's a good idea, let's be things rather than pretend to be things. But back in the Drupal 5 era, the best you could do is look like the design. You can't be the design. It's not even an option. So let's now talk about the past-ish present. How does this mentality evolve as we move into Drupal 6 and Drupal 7? We start trying to make our lives easier, and as we do, we add more and more tools and make Drupal a lot less simple. So Larry Garfield, back in 2009, uh, one of Palantir's um, most prominent developers, he is an initiative lead on, on Drupal 8, and back in 2009, he was saying, instead of overriding theme functions, write a new field formatter. If you do that, you'll get something that's encapsulated, flexible, you can move it, uh, onto another site, you can reuse it on this existing site. That's a better way to do it than overriding your themes. Or in the case of views module or query building and list listing module, um, write a new style plugin or a display plugin or an argument handler. That's better than doing everything in CSS or overriding these theme functions. So. Here's an example from the view cycle module back in 2008, 2009, 2010. Everybody was taking that jQuery cycle uh, plugin and building a views module with it. I think I built a views module with it that I never contributed. Larry built one which eventually got deprecated by view slideshow. But here was a chance where we could be the thing. This div tells me I am view cycle. We're printing individual rows from a listing in a way that makes them be the slideshow. That's good, that's easier. But it's another API to learn. Yes, we get something that's clean, extensible, reusable, but the tool chain that a front-end developer in Drupal is expected to know just got a little bit bigger. Back at the beginning of the sustainable theming era, the idea is CSS, that's all you need to know. Here's more divs than you could ever want. Just write CSS, make it look right. Now we're starting to shift towards, now if you know PHP and can write a field formatter or use display plugin, uh, you can make it be the thing. You can get better markup this way. So what are we doing? 
are we making are we writing CSS to make a view look like a slideshow or are we writing a display plugin to make a view be a slideshow and Drupal 7's complexity makes this question really hard to even notice the theme system in Drupal 7 got more and more complex render arrays were added process functions were added in addition to pre-process functions more ways to override more ways to alter more ways to do everything and each of these bubbles makes something easier but they make the system as a whole a lot less simple a lot less easy to understand modifying markup from core you can do pre-process you can do process you can do theme hook suggestions you can do field formatters you can use hook field extra fields you can write new theme functions, you can use render arrays, you can just shove stuff in hook node load. That's just core. You can trim, you can use the panel suite, you can use display suite, you can use views display plugins, you can suppress unwanted divs with fences, you can add more view modes, and it starts to feel like Plinko. You're dropping in your content at one end, it comes out the other, but how it gets there is really hard to know. Uh, or maybe it feels like mousetrap where there are so many different mechanisms along the way that it's really hard to know where are you supposed to do something. Do I want to change a class, or should I just have to take the class I have? Or if I want to change a class, does that tell me you no, know, I should actually be writing a field formatter or a display plugin? Um, but what are we doing? We're doing whatever feels easier, not what's simpler. And if you're a, a one-person operation, following what's easiest, that may be okay because you're going to consistently pick the same things. But on a team of a couple people, different people will answer easy in a different way. One person who knows CSS really well will say, CSS is easy, I'm gonna do everything with CSS. Another person who knows how to write field formatters and these different plugins are gonna say, no, that's pretty easy, and if I do it that way, then I'll be able to reuse it more easily later. So we get, we get inconsistency, disagreement. Um, but why were we trying to do sustainable theming in the first place? Why did we think that that could work? Uh, it, we knew it involved patience, long-term planning. It, re it required us to know Drupal's inner structures, to know how that Drupal 5 tool chain worked. The sustainable theming mentality requires that the themer knows how the theme system works. But how many people <laughs> know how this works? Not many. Nope, I hit the wrong button. So in chasing easy, we've lost simple in this Drupal 7 era. But there's hope. In the future-ish present, our circumstances start to change. We're making the markup match now. And, they, uh, and those changes come because our givens have changed. It's now a given that our clients want a responsive site. The idea that you can make a picture of a website in Photoshop and say, I have designed a website, that idea has gone away. If you want to design a website now, it's gotta be responsive. The design has to be responsive. Which means designers need to be working with CSS. So back in 2011, we did one of our, our first responsive projects for a client for the University of, of Michigan. And figuring out how are all these elements going to reflow as you go from desktop to tablet to mobile, that's hard to do. And it's a task that you can only do in the browser by writing CSS. So our designers who didn't have much experience with markup, didn't have much experience with CSS, got into the browser, started making wireframes, drawing out the big pieces in black and white, figuring out how is this body field going to squish? How is the, the header menu going to change? When is it going to break from one line to something that is a drop down? Um, so our designers get better and better at HTML and CSS. And it starts to become a given that our designs, our canonical designs, are in HTML and CSS. So that really verbose Drupal markup that we've been complaining about for years, now we really don't want it because we have markup that is good, it's done. The CSS is done. So why are we still using Drupal's? Um, here's a project we did uh, about two years later. 
Public Radio International. Uh, again, our designers were doing static prototyping, figuring out the ideal market, the ideal CSS that they wanted, and then our Drupal front-end developers were taking that CSS, copying and pasting it into Drupal's theme files, and editing it, making it a little bit better, making the markup a little bit different. The menu system, especially in Drupal, is really verbose, so that CSS would probably get tweaked heavily. And as we do that, we basically fork our CSS. We have the version that was done in the designs, and we have the real version that's in Drupal. Um, that, starts to get, that starts to get painful. Um, yes, it's nice that our designers are thinking in design components. We can look at this box and the designer can say, I think of this as a home page story block. And the developer can say, I think of this as an article teaser. Okay, we now have a way to map between our design component language and our Drupal understanding. That's a good thing. Um, the fork CSS is not. Um, and one more given, everybody wants a living style guide. The idea that you can have this canonical design and it can evolve over time. But if you fork your CSS, if you have one copy of your CSS in the design and one that's in Drupal, that's going to be really hard to keep it living. You're more likely going to have a Frankenstein zombie style guide that kind of matches the real version, but if there's no way to really reconcile them, um, it's not, it's not going to live. Um, so what we what we started doing is keeping the CSS exactly the same in both places. We're doing our designing in a static tool, either uh, Jekyll or Sculpin, or sometimes just simple uh, HTML files with no processing at all. Uh, and the CSS can be exactly the same in the designs and in Drupal. So our jobs as Drupal developers then becomes getting the markup to match. Have Drupal print exactly the markup that the designers said was the ideal markup. For a style guide to be living, the CSS and the markup has to be the same in both places. If we make the markup match, the CSS just works. So why didn't we do that before? Uh, again, back in the 2008-2009 Drupal 5 era, we considered it, and Colleen in, in a blog post said, yeah, the strip it, strip all the markup out methodology gives you a lot of power, you can get exactly what you want, but it's really hard to maintain that in 2008-2009. It's unlikely that you're going to be able to add another content type without having to uh, write a whole bunch of code all over again. But now we have the technology. All of those contrib modules, all of those layers in Drupal 7, one of these has to make this idea easier. So let's imagine our static prototype has this design component. It's a relatively simple design component. We've got an image, a date, a headline. And our, our designers have said, this is the ideal markup. We've got an article tag, nice and semantic. The class is illustrated list item. That's the name of the design component an illustrated list item. It's not node space, node hyphen article. That's Drupal's understanding. The front end design component understanding is this is an illustrated list item. And inside of that, you've got a figure for the image, you've got uh, the date, you've got a title field. So of those contrib tools, are, are any of them going to be able to help us? We've got the panel suite, we have display suite, use display plugins, Fences, view modes. Uh, panels have become our go to tool for mapping design components. Layout plugins within panels are a great way to <coughs> map that design component. Uh, we copy that markup from the static prototype, put it in a panels TPL, and all we're doing is taking out the content and printing in a variable. We get to keep all of the, the nice design-oriented CSS classes and print inside of that the content. And a separation between template thinking and data thinking. That's an idea that's been around for a long time, but it's gotten really fuzzy in Drupal, um, especially the last couple of years. So uh, 
here's the panels interface. This is specifically mini panels. There are a lot of panels modules. This is perhaps the simplest. So you tell panels what the incoming data is that you expect. I expect a node. And where are we going? We're going to an illustrated list item. That's the design component that we're going to use. And then finally, here are the instructions for how you take uh, that node object and turn it into something that you can actually print. Take the date field off the node object, put it in the date. Take the title, put in the title. Take the image, put in the image. Uh, this is a, you know, a simpler example, but what we like about the panel suite is that we can apply these concepts to multiple layers of Drupal. The panels everywhere module corresponds to the page.tpl layer of Drupal, basically the largest <laughs> layer. Your header, your footer, global sidebar, that sort of thing. Page manager is the main content level, so uh, the content variable inside of page.tpl. Uh, panelizer maps to view modes, basically all the various ways you might print a single piece of content like that illustrated list item we just saw. Uh, panelizer lets you map from a view mode to the design component. And many panels work at the block level, all the small pieces that you might want to reuse anywhere on your site. So in the future-ish present, we try to be the design by making the markup match. The CSS, we figured out how to make that exactly the same in both places. The markup, we're still trying to get it to match. Um, but to quote Dumbledore, do or do not, there is no try. It's just a, a way of seeing who's paying attention. <laughs> Dumbledore. <laughs> it's a quote from Yoda with a picture of Gandalf attributed to Dumbledore. I really like these images. Uh, let's jump to the future. Clear decoupling. Headless Drupal, headless Drupal, headless, 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 headless Drupal. I promised a dozen references to headless Drupal in the session description. Uh, is the hot topic in the Drupal community. So what do we mean by headless? Headless software is software capable of working on a device without a graphical user interface. That's the simple definition according to Wikipedia. And Drupal has been able to work headless for years. Drush is the command line utility for working with Drupal without a user interface. But that's not what the headless Drupal community is talking about. They're talking about Ember, Angular, all these front end MVCs, web components, seems to be the next big target on the horizon. The front end world is moving a lot faster than Drupal core. And there's a subset of the Drupal community that's trying to figure out how are we going to work with all of these front end technologies that seem to be winning the web as a whole. So if you want Drupal to be headless, where do you chop? How do you chop off Drupal's head? Do you chop it off before the theme function? With theme item list, we have all these variables before we ever called theme. It would be pretty easy to replicate an item list in Angular, in anything at all. All we're doing is taking a simple array of variables and printing them into an unordered list. That's easy. But node, I, I don't want to chop off before the theme function with node because I can't print this. All this tells me is I was made by UID 456, but I want to print the user's name. All this tells me is the image I have is 789, that's my file ID. But you don't, you don't want to print 789, you want to print an actual image URL. And all of that is figured out in all the many, many layers that happen inside the theme function. So uh, the headless community, or some people in the headless community are saying, just give me the raw data. But the raw data is nowhere near printable. Uh, there's a, a manifesto on GitHub for the headless community. They're calling out Drupal's uh, conflation of our data and our controllers. With the node printing, it's really hard to say when have we switched from figuring out our data to printing our data. It's a continuous game of Plinko, just about. 
uh, as our variables get downstream. And if you want to be a front-end developer in Drupal, unfortunately, right now you need heavy PHP skills. Um, <coughs> what can we do? What can we do to fix this? Uh, we can separate our concerns. That's been a best practice in web development for years, and software development for decades. Do one thing in one place. Don't do everything in all the places. Uh, this. This horseman repository is even suggesting that the only way we can make headless Drupal work well is to first fix headed Drupal, because we want the same, we want the same things. We want to sensibly go from a raw node object to something that we can print, and that's that's going to be hard anywhere you do it. And if we figure it out well in one place, it can apply to both places. So. Luckily, there's some client pressure on this evolution. Clients are going to see the value in decoupling. And, and I'll make a prediction that eventually we're going to start uh, redoing Drupal 7 sites. The responsive era came in just as Drupal <coughs> 7 was getting released. So there are sites that were built in Drupal 6 in 2009, 2010. And at Palantir, what we were telling people years ago is if you're on Drupal 5, wait for Drupal 7. If you're on Drupal 6, wait for Drupal 8. But if you, but if you built on Drupal 6 in 2009, you need a responsive site yesterday or last year because in 2009, your Drupal 6 site was not built responsive. So even though years ago we were saying, yeah, skip from 6 to 8 and from 5 to 7, a lot of our recent projects have been 6 to 7 because clients need responsive and they need it yesterday. Uh, and while they like the improved editorial tools that Drupal 7 has over Drupal 6, it's responsive that's writing the check, basically. That's the highest priority for a lot of our Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 migrations. They're happy to get the better editorial tools, but it's the responsive piece that, that really motivates the project. So, Todd Ross Nineberg of Four Kitchens describes our current situation like this. You get a new CMS and you can redesign your site. Next time you want to redesign your site, you need to upgrade your whole CMS because looking back at those CSS classes that we saw before, if your CSS class is views hyphen field hyphen field hyphen headline hyphen value, that CSS is completely coupled to that version of Drupal. Trying to use that CSS with another version of Drupal is going to be really painful. Don't bother. Redesign at the same time you upgrade your CMS. That's what we're doing now. Uh, Todd thinks <coughs> that the future is decoupling, being able to redesign your front end website without touching the back end. I think this is going to get easier as we move forward. Uh, I think as these headless tools get better and better, not just for Drupal 8, but for Drupal 7, we're going to do some projects that are on top of existing Drupal 7 websites, and we'll either use Angular or something else, but we'll redesign the front end of the Drupal 7 site without changing the content types, without changing the fields, without changing much of the underlying back end structure. And then later, maybe we can upgrade it to Drupal 8 without touching the front end. Okay. So, so the tools that you're talking about, mm -hmm. basically tools that I think Angular itself is relatively agnostic about where the data is coming from. Uh, I think it expects to be given a, a, a model of data to which it can bind, and it, Angular itself doesn't really care where the data comes from. So one of the main challenges in Drupal now is to figure out how can we present a data model, either <coughs> JSON, XML, something, how can we present a JSON file out to the world and Angular can bind just to that. So I'll, I think I, I might be answering your question in, in a future slide. So it's a given that the front end is changing a lot faster than Drupal core, certainly. There's no way Drupal core is going to be able to say, Angular version one, we're targeting that, and let's modify Drupal core to serve Angular version one. That'd be a bad idea because Angular's just announced they're going to completely rewrite for version two. 
Great. It works well for Drupal. Go for it, Angular. Uh, so we can't target specific versions, uh, but we can look for common patterns. Uh, encapsulation. These front-end tools are getting better and better at encapsulating a given thing. So we looked at that illustrated list item before, the idea of an encapsulated design component that is just, I start with an article, I end as the article closes. Uh, Angular web components are a lot better than Drupal Core at describing where their front end pieces stop and start. Data binding, what we were just talking about. They expect to be given a data model. They can take that data model in, render it simply for presentation, and a lot of them um, highly value the ability to send data back out, so doing complex form components. Um, that's, and that's a concept <coughs> that really doesn't have. We, we can send our node object into the node.tpl, but the idea that it would come back out of the node.tpl, that's, that's not a concept that we have. Um, the idea that we could send the node object into a template that doesn't even know what it's getting came from a node, that's, that's a concept that Drupal Core doesn't really have. Um, that's where, that's one of the things we like about Panama's layout plugins. They, the layout <coughs> itself does not know where its data came from. That's a good thing. The template shouldn't have to know every single thing about its data source. Uh, interfaces. These front-end tools are getting better at describing what they do. That's been a huge boon to Drupal 8 on the server side to have classes that describe the things they do. These front-end components are a lot better at describing the things they do. That's not really a concept we have in the Drupal core world. Our theme hooks don't describe what they do. Cleaner extension. This is a concept that we're starting to get in Drupal 8 with Twig, the idea that a template can extend another template. Uh, Drupal core has a lot of block specific templates that look a whole lot like each other. And Twig gives us a tool for saying, uh, I'm just like that other template, but I'm changing this one part. Older versions of Drupal don't have that concept. They just have the concept of templates inside of templates inside of other templates. Um, concept of extension exists in these modern front-end tools, and we should start thinking about it. Um, so in the future, what are we doing? We're pulling usable variables into independent design components. If we can think of our design components independent <coughs> of the source data, that's a good thing. Um, when you're writing them, you'll need to move back and forth between your data model and your design components to make sure they work together. That illustrated list item, if we're trying to render that with nodes that had no images, that would be a problem. Um, but the design object itself doesn't need to know everything about its data sources. So no one's going to be able to jump to the future in one big step. Yeah, we've, we've seen a Palantir evolution over the last six years. This has all been incremental, often painful steps. Um, but we can Take, take some indications that we're moving in the right direction. If we can draw clear lines between our data and our presentation, that's a good thing. If our design components can be defined in one place, either one file or one folder, the idea that you can go to a single file and understand how is this design component put together. That idea isn't really present in Drupal 4 right now. If you open up the node.tpl file, you're not going to get a good understanding of where did all this stuff come from. To understand where it all came from, you're going to have to look in a dozen different places. Um, if you can define your design component in one place, you're moving to the future. If you can hang your design components independent of Drupal, illustrated list item instead of article teaser, that's a sign that you're decoupling your design thinking from your data. If, you're, if even your templates and your functions uh, inside of Drupal can be named after the design components instead of your Drupal data structures. If you can make changes to your front end code outside of Drupal, pull it back into Drupal and have it just work, that's a good sign. We're doing that at Palantir right now with our CSS. We can change our CSS in the prototype, pull it into Drupal, and it just works. Uh, 
That's conceptually also easier with JavaScript to encapsulate uh, a JavaScript plugin, be able to use it somewhere else, pull it into Drupal. We've seen that Drupal <coughs> jQuery with that views uh, cycle module, just pulling in a third party jQuery library, uh, jQuery cycle that itself knows nothing about Drupal. Uh, the templates, I think, are going to be the hard part. Uh, with Twig in, in Drupal 8, Twig is used by other systems. It would be great if we can use exactly the same templates in Drupal and in our canonical designs. Um, how to do that? I'm not sure yet, but I, I'm working on it. Um, and if you can imagine a front-end developer on a Drupal project not knowing PHP, that'll be a good thing. Uh, it's really hard to do that right now. You can if, if you make it clear this person is not going to touch PHP at all. At, at my last job, I knew that. I knew that I had a coworker who was great at CSS. I could, we could talk together, talk about what the page was going to be. I could say, all right, here's your markup. Here's your CSS file. Tell me when it looks like the design. Back in 2010, that was a fine way to work. Um, now, in the present, in the future, it'll be great if we can say, uh, I'm a Drupal expert. Here's your data model. And someone else can say, I'm a web component expert. I'll take that data model in JSON form, and I'll make it work in my web component, and not worry about PHP at all. That'll be a good sign. And on more of a process level, uh, at, at Palantir, we're trying to get our front-end developers and our designers working together on the same things at the same time, more and more. Often, our contracts can make that hard. Uh, sometimes a contract might be structured so that design happens first and then development or vice versa. Uh, and if your CSS experts or your front-end developers who are your best people at HTML and CSS aren't working with the designers at the same time, it's going to make it harder. So we're doing more pair programming, um, more peer review, more pull request reviews between our designers and our developers, and it's, it's a uh, getting us farther along. Um, I think inside of Palantir, uh, our developers will need to push for the next whatever it is. Our design team was largely responsible for pushing us to static prototyping. They recognized um, before a lot of people that to do responsive well that they would have to be working in the browser. That was great that our design team was able to, to lead us forward like that. I think the next jump into web components or Angular is going to have to get, get pushed by our developers. Um, as you're working with CSS, our <coughs> developers will need to be asking themselves, am I making X look like Y, or am I making X be Y? There's still some, some times when it's okay to not completely change the markup, to say, this is the markup I've got, I'm going to work with it, I'll write CSS to change the way it looks. Uh, but as I said, Drupal 7 can often cloud this question. Um, designers can state the data each design component relies on. This is a, a question that often goes back and forth right now. Uh, what happens if that image isn't there? It's not a required field. Can we come up with ways for our design components to say, I expect an image, and if there isn't an image, I'm not going to work. So on the data side, that better be a required field. Um, we're still coming up with, with better ways to, to state that explicitly. So to sum up, in the past, you make the default markup look like the designs. In the present, we're matching the markup, and the CSS just works. In the future, we hope to make the real site's design components be the canonical design components. Not just look like them, not just match them 90%, but actually <coughs> Thanks, everybody. Okay. Have you tried out the classy panel style module at all? I have not. Is that a backport that's, of the classy? You know, that's actually it was made by Kendall and Derek at MediaCurrent. Okay. Um, I talked to them about it at Google Camp Atlanta. No, it was for it last year they brought it. Mm -hmm. year. Brought it up, and I know they rebuilt their site on it. It allows for a more modular way of designing the 
panel things so mm -hmm. that way you can do like your own components. Yeah. And they their requirement was content editors should be able to go on the site, use the IPE, mm -hmm. change what everything looks like without knowing CSS or any code. And that's right. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to like revisit it. I don't know if maybe you can invest in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not personally been on a project that's used the IPE. I've helped out on a project that's used it. I mean, you used yeah. to use like in the back end. Like, sure. Yeah. 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 So there was a lot of uh, advanced stuff in your presentation. Mm -hmm. If someone was like, I don't know, knew, knew some CSS, knew some HTML, and wanted to like start theming Drupal like in the sense of trying mm -hmm. to make Drupal look like something, mm -hmm. what approach would you suggest them to do to get started? Like jump straight to doing you know stuff with panels and making mm -hmm. layout templates and all that, or starting somewhere else? Uh, I think the the look like model is, is a good place to start at least. That's that's where I started, that's where Palantir uh, worked um, when we started with Drupal. That's that's the model that Drupal core encourages. Drupal still is at its heart a click it together system and then change how it looks system. So, um, like basically yeah. sticking with the markup that Drupal gives you and then making all of your customizations in CSS, that sort of approach? Yeah, if, if I were starting completely fresh with Drupal and I were doing what I was doing when I started in Drupal, which was making um, relatively basic sites, I would, there's, so, there's so much Drupalisms on configuring the content types, configuring the use listings, um, I think one of the reasons people had the mentality of let's just accept the markup was because everything else was was and still is hard to figure out. <laughs> so you only have so much mental energy. If you spend all your mental energy figuring out the content types, figuring how 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 do I get this query in views to work at all, there's not much energy left for. And now I want to figure out where this div is coming from so I can get rid of this one div. Or where is this class coming from because I want to change it. No, you're probably going to just style on field type and headline instead of a more front end class, I don't know, title with like field headline on the design side. Title probably seems like a better fit rather than field type and headline, but if you don't know where field type and headline is coming from, who cares? Uh, and and SAS makes that easier too, because SAS lets you write your ideal CSS on the ideal classes that you want. And you can pretend in your SAS, I am styling the class called title. Oh right, Drupal's not printing the class title's printing field headline, okay, I'll extend or I'll tack on that as a selector. Um, John Alvin Wilkins, um, the guy who made the big scary diagram, um, in his last DrupalCon presentation, talked about the ugly selector hack, the idea that uh, you can think in the design component, you can think in terms of the ideal selector that you want, and then you can use SAS extension to say, Okay, but the selector Drupal is giving me is this longer, uglier selector, so I'll extend to have the CSS really use that longer selector. But in my SAS, I can still think I'm working with this nice class that makes more sense to me in design language. Well, well thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for listening. No. Pay for the rent. Uh, so Erica gave me the.